Thank you, Colby. How's everyone doing this morning? If I get the coffee, I haven't had my coffee yet. Let me just adjust this real quick. Okay, ASU. So definitely, I want to give thanks to uh, the Prison Education Awareness Club for you know, investing in people who society has deemed outcasts and have just uh, uh, discounted. You know, it takes courage to be able to do that work. And I remember when I was locked up, you know, I, could, I always used to ask my professors, why do you keep coming in here? Why do you keep coming in here when I'm trying to fight to get out? You know, um, and I remember Carol Benson, her very simple answer, but yet powerful, she simply said, um, you. You know, and to me, that was very, very impactful at the time. Um, to this day, I said we're still friends. And also shout out to Kobe Kelly from Portal Square Media. She's been very instrumental in ensuring that these conversations on these topics make it into spaces, which, you know, before was just, you know, a dream to be able to have, have these conversations. So I'm very grateful and honored and privileged to be working with PSM on these issues. So ignorance, ignorance can be likened to darkness, right? And education seems to be the illuminating light that eliminates that darkness. And I came to that sudden realization when, or epiphany, if you will, when I was sentenced to 15 years in a space no bigger than my hotel bathroom. See, at the time, my name was not Johnny Perez, and my, name, and I, and my title was not Director of U.S. Prison Programs. Instead, my name was 018-5068, and my title, according to the Department of Corrections, was Inmate Perez. See, my home at the time was Katsaki Correctional Facility, which is a maximum security uh, prison in New York State. And throughout my journey with incarceration and engaging in education, I've learned a few lessons that I hope to share with, uh, with all of you today. See, the first thing that I learned is that, you know, school districts, like the one that I grew up in and went to as a kid, fun would prepare kids, prepare kids for prison. This was made evident to me every time that I walked inside of a school and had to remove my belt, my shoes, my watch, and my wallet just so I can clear the McNamara. This was also made clear to me every time that there was a dispute in the school and school safety would show up with handcuffs out. So it wasn't until recently where I learned, where I really thought about it and I said, wow, the first time that I actually saw a gun in person was actually in a school on the waist of a school safety officer um, in public school 16 when I went to school when I was a kid. So it's no wonder that years later when I arrived in prison, the metal detector seemed very familiar to me. The handcuffs on my wrist only served as a reminder about that time that I cursed out Mrs. Stevens because she called my mother lazy because she learned she was on public assistance. Little did she know that my mother was a single mother of four with little to no education herself who was, dealing, who was doing the best she could with the hand she was dealt because of a man who was not man enough to stay um, and take care of his kids. I also learned that sometimes people believe in us more than we believe in ourselves. And speaking about Carol Benson, my, po my poetry professor at the time when I was incarcerated, she invested in me because she saw me as an, as an individual who was more than just the worst thing that I've done in my life. She, she introduced me to the power of language and granted me the freedom of expression in an environment where freedom is just a dream. Where freedom only existed in theory, not in practice. And ultimately, one of those poems that I wrote um, uh, that I actually came up from that class um, actually made it into the newest edition of the Fordham Law School, of the Fordham Law Journal. Little would I know that, you know, my discovery of the power of language will later on fuel my career and be able to take my voice and the wisdom of those experiences to educate people on what happens inside of those cells. Eventually, of course, like Kobe mentioned, a lot of my writing will make it into the New York Times, the Washington Post, Ebony, the Wall Street Journal, and countless, of course, countless digital um, uh, uh, media outlets. I've also learned that we give ourselves permission to look the other way and discard people based on the labels that we placed on them. We saw it during Nazi Germany and we see it today. A lot of the commentary is very, very common, you know, ex-con, criminal, jailbird. See, for a lot of years I was called an inmate instead of Johnny. And what's the problem with that? See, the problem with that is not only that it's dehumanizing and demoralizing, but also regulates a person's whole existence of them being in prison. See, there are things that I can do to an inmate that I can't do to a human being. There are things that I can do to an ex-con that I can't do to somebody's mother, or those, one, those may be one and the same. So I urge you to be very mindful about the way that you describe people in prison. I would even urge you to even just eliminate the word inmate, criminal, ex-con completely from your vocabulary. And if you're thinking, well, Johnny, if I can't say inmate, well, then what do I say? Just say people. 
people who are in prison, people who have been criminalized, people who are currently incarcerated, people who are formerly incarcerated. And I know here in, in, the, in, in the state of Arizona, the department is actually in some cases mandated that people say inmate and not name, and I get that. But it also speaks to the demoralizing and dehumanization that happens for that happens at the hands of the same system that we're trusting to rehabilitate the folks who are inside of those cells. Which brings me to my next lesson, right? That people in prison are not incorrigible individuals who are innately criminal. Criminals are not born, they're made. Due to environmental factors and a bunch of other variables, y'all all are educators, I don't have to go into that, right? But the problem with that is that some people believe, because they believe that criminals are born Right, they discount the, the importance of having to educate folks who are inside. And I've literally seen it firsthand and heard it directly from questioners who say, well, Johnny, if we teach somebody who's been incarcerated of, somebody who was convicted of a burglary, if we teach them computer skills, then what we have now is a computer hacker. They'll never change, they only just become better criminals. We can't teach them. And then there's another school of thought that says, well, we can teach them. And if you teach somebody who's been convicted of burglary, if you teach them computer skills, what you have now is a software engineer and a person who can not have to feel the need to apply criminal solutions to their problems and being able to be a productive member of the same society that we all share. No wonder, no wonder that a lot of different correctional institutions actually don't provide access to higher education for the people in prison because they truly believe that folks will not change. And I'm telling you that that's not true. And the evidence is not only in my life and Pastor Benny's life, but countless and millions of others who have discovered a transformative education while inside those cells. And my last lesson, which I want to share with you today, is that the transformative power of education is something that is already effective in fighting recidivism and incarceration, but yet so underutilized by different departments of corrections. See, the funny thing about education is that the more you know, the more that you learn, the more you want to, the, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. And that, in turn, fuels your need to want to know more. And it's the cyclical process which ultimately leads to the transformative power that is harnessed in education. So in my experience, throughout my, 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 my journey of incarceration, I discovered education in prison, and I remember being locked inside of the six by nine cell, and right from that cell, I traveled the entire world. I marched with Martin Luther King during the Civil Rights era. I cried with Holocaust survivors after World War II. I even visited the Leaning Tower of Pisa, Pisa and, the hanging and, the hanging, and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. I even compared cheesecake recipes with Martha Stewart right from that cell. More importantly, I pulled my pants up. I took out the gold teeth out of my mouth, I cut my hair, I stopped smoking weed and I stopped smoking cigarettes, I stopped using the N-word. In fact, my whole, my whole self-concept and the way that I viewed myself and my self-identity changed. And more importantly, I saw opportunities but before I only saw challenges and I saw stepping stones but before I only saw nothing but barriers. And here it is, five years after my release, I traveled the country building the capacity of faith leaders to have them engage in legislative advocacy around conditions of confinement, specifically solitary confinement, since I myself spent three years in solitary confinement. I work with the United States Civil Rights Commission where we're looking at policing practices and policies that are having a disparate effect on communities of color. And I also work with the New York City Bar Association's Reentry and Corrections Committee uh, on conditions of confinement, on specifically Rikers Island spoken in many places like Kobe mentioned. You know, but most importantly, I'm a father to a 17-year-old girl who's going on 40, um, who was also born two days before I was arrested and sentenced to 15 years in prison. And I'll tell you, despite all of the accolades and all of the accomplishments that I've been able to, to accomplish in the last five years has been mainly due because of the people that I've surrounded, that are surrounded around myself, uh, surrounded, that I've been surrounded by, who see, who have invested in me more, who I believe in me more than I believe in myself, and even then I still believe that I'm not yet the man that I could be, and neither am I yet the man that I need to be. But thanks to the transformative power of education, I'm no longer the man that I used to be. Thanks for letting me share y'all. <laughs>